All right, so I think we could get started. So today, um, this lecture is not really going to be about PlusCal. I couldn't find a paper that was a good match for what I wanted to this lecture to be about. But I'll talk a fair amount about the relationship between the things that I'm going to be saying and, and the PlusCal paper. So the goal for today is to really understand how to prove that a concurrent program implements a spec and also to learn some things about um, what's practical for concurrency and what's not, or maybe I should say it another way, what's easy and what's hard. And for that, the, the key issue is how do you make large atomic actions out of small ones? So that's roughly speaking the agenda. And let's start by reviewing um, two different approaches to writing down uh, a spec or, or a piece of code. One approach is the one that we've talked about several times before, which is the state machine approach. So the story here, remember, is that you can model any system as a global state with atomic transitions yeah. between, yeah. between different uh, between different states, and, then, and we call them steps. And then we say that some of the state is visible or external, the rest is internal, and it's the external state that you try to match up between the spec and the code that supposedly implements it. And this view of things will work uh, regardless of the fact that in the physical implementation, there isn't any agent that can actually see the whole state, but we are not in the physical implementation. We're, we're in the, the world of, of proofs and understanding. Continuing the review, remember a trace, which is also something called a behavior or a history, is a sequence of states. And an action is a set of possible steps. So the, the canonical example is x gets x plus 1, which corresponds to the steps going from x equals 0 to x equals 1, or from x equals 1 to x equals 2, and so forth. And of course, we're not going to write down th these sets explicitly. For one thing, they're, they're usually not finite. So we have to have some other way to define them. And the standard way of doing that is with the pre predicate of a, on the state, the current state and the next state. So the predicate for x gets x plus one is x prime. That's the next state value of x equals x plus one. And the spec, we think of a spec as a set of visible traces that describes what the system's allowed to do. And remember, we say that a piece of code satisfies a spec if the visible traces of the code are a subset of the visible traces of the spec. So that, that should all be familiar. We've, we've been there before a couple of times. Uh, the other way of looking at things is what, what I think of as the language way, where you, you start with primitives, which are expressions and that is, that is pure functions on, on the variables and an assignment operation that can change the value of a variable. And then you can put these atomic expression and assignment uh, commands together with a small number of operators. And the basic idea of the semantics here is that aside from assignment, which is fundamental, um, you're always composing smaller actions into a bigger action. So I'm not gonna go through this whole list because we've seen most of these things before in one form or another. Um, but just notice uh, the, the semantics, the action semantics for V gets, e, for the command V gets assigned E is the, the final state of V is equal to E. And for all the other variables, they don't change their, their value. <clears throat> and then the, the most, uh, Maybe the, the, the most um, puzzling uh, example of, of an operator that puts two commands together is the, is the semicolon, which is the first sequential composition, which says there has to be some intermediate state such that the first command gets you from S to the intermediate state and the second command gets you from the immediate state, intermediate state to the final state S prime and so on and so forth for the various other operators that can, that can put commands together. So I, that, that was one way to give precise semantics 
to each command by V. So we're writing down the action that is the current state next state predicate that describes what the command does. Another way to do it, which we've seen in the context of the labs, is with weakest preconditions. And the basic idea there is that the weakest, the weakest precondition for C, for command C and yeah. that will lead to Q is defined as the weakest, pre, weakest predicate P such that if P is true and you do C, then Q will be true. So the way that, how does that correspond to action semantics? The answer is, if you take, if you have the weakest precondition of Q and you do C, then you get Q, it will imply Q. And there are various other ways to map around between weakest preconditions and or triples and so on and so forth. So yeah, after that whirlwind review of what we know about uh, state machine descriptions and language descriptions, let's just consider how they compare or don't or contrast. State machines basically are flat. There isn't any structure in the way, way you write down the, the um, actions except when you introduce an abstraction, which we haven't uh, talked about in any detail. Languages on the other hand are recursive. You build the program up from smaller parts using the composition operators, semicolon and, and uh, if and else and, and so on. My view is state machines are foundational. You can express any system using only set theory and first order logic. And that's what Lamport's TLA does. And for example, there's no built-in notion of sequential execution, such as threads. If you want to have the notion of a thread in the state machine world, yeah. you have to build it. It, yeah. it's, it, it doesn't um, come built in. Uh, by contrast, the, the notion of sequential execution is fairly, fairly fundamental to the language view. And uh, if you introduce some, some sort of parallel composition operator, that's an add-on. The language semantics, as I gave them on the previous slides, depends on the idea of non-interference. The build-up scheme for giving the semantics depends on the fact that each command establishes some facts that allow you to reason about the next one. And correspondingly, the, the uh, proof approaches tend to be quite different in, in flavor, although fundamentally at, at, at bottom, they all have to be doing the same thing. But you do state machine proofs by establishing an invariant that holds uh, no matter which step you're at. And you, you do language proofs by weakest preconditions or whore triples or strongest post conditions or something like that. And we'll see in some detail how the invariant approach works out with state machines as we go along. Okay, so much for preliminaries. Now let's try to understand what's going on with concurrency. So in general, a state machine has, as we said, has a set of actions. Zero or more of them are gonna be enabled in any given state. That is, if they're not blocked, they could uh, happen. And the next step is gonna be one of these actions. In a sequential world, there's only one action enabled at a time. So there's no doubt about what the next step is gonna be. But in the concurrent world, of course, that's not true. There could be lots of actions enabled. Usually we think in terms of possibly having one action enabled for each thread. And we'll see in just a minute what that really means. If you're gonna do a proof using invariants, then any enabled action has to maintain the invariant. This is why sequential reasoning is fundamentally simpler because there's only one next step that you have to worry about each time for maintaining the invariant. Whereas when, when things are concurrent, you have, at each point, when, at each state where the invariant's already been established and you wanna see whether the next state is still gonna maintain the invariant, you have to worry about every possible next step of which there's, there may be many. So that's the fundamental reason why sequential reasoning is simpler. Okay, so what about threads? Um, 
if you code up thread that's on the state machine foundation, the way you do that is by saying that you have uh, some notion of a, of a thread identifier, which carries with it a PC. And there's a set of labeled actions in the entire state machine. And if the PC for, for thread H is at the value L, then you're gonna do the L action and the next PC is gonna be some L prime. So this is the way you, you take um, the sequential world where you only have to worry about what the actions are and map it into the concurrent world where you have to, where you have to worry about the fact that there's a bunch of threads each executing its own sequence of actions going from L to L prime. So then if you think about yeah, this as the, the predicate for an action, what does it mean? It means that the action is only going to be enabled when the PC for thread H is at L, because otherwise the, the uh, precondition here is going to be false. And of course, for the action to be enabled, AL has to be enabled too. And then if you take this step, the, piece, uh, the, the, the step is going to do whatever AL does to the rest of the state. And in addition to that, it's going to change the PC to L prime, which is the next, the next step. And the next step, of course, can be from any thread whose PC is at one of these enabled actions. So that's the basic story about threads in the world of state machines. In this story, A is an atomic action. That means it runs as a single step. There might be complicated things going on inside, but, but at this level of abstraction, we're not thinking about them. And it has to be the case that this reasoning is sound. And we want these atomic actions, of course, to be as big as possible. We're gonna spend uh, a large part of this lecture sketching out how we achieve that. Okay, if there's any questions so far, it would be a good, now would be a good time to ask. Okay, so how do we define a state machine? We already said a state machine is just a set of traces, but we also said that we're not gonna write down those traces explicitly. Instead, we're going to, a set, any set can be defined by a predicate that's true exactly on the, uh, uh, on the members of the set. So that means that the state machine is going to be defined by a predicate on its traces. So what is that predicate going to look like? It's going to look like this. There's some initial, initial state predicate, which has to be true for the first state of the trace. And then there's going to be a next step predicate, which is going to say, say how you can get from, from the state i to state i plus one. So that's what next is going to do. We start out in state. Whoops. What's happened here? Oh dear. It's fighting me. Here we go. We start out in, in state. Oh, sorry. We start out in state S, and then we're going to go via the next action, state S prime. And we're going to do that repeatedly uh, in a little bit more detail. So init is a state predicate that define the, define the possible initial states. And next is an action predicate that defines the possible steps. And usually we write this next predicate as a disjunction of a whole bunch of um, component actions. So each of these AIs defines one of the possible actions of the whole state machine. And if the AIs, for example, so if, if you had a sequential program, which was coded up in, in this style, each AI would be one of these guys here, which says the PC starts at L, you do some atomic action, and you end up with the PC at L, at L prime. And there's gonna be one of these for each atomic action in the sequential program. For that matter, there's gonna be one of these for each action in the, concur in the concurrent program as well. It's just that more of them are gonna be enabled. 
uh, just a little bit of mechanics. Uh, we say that, that a predicate P is true of a trace if it's true of the first state of the trace. And we say that an action is true of a trace if it's true of the pre and post sta states of the first step. And then we have this operator henceforth, which is true if it's true of every suffix of a trace. So that means it has to, if, if Q is a predicate, it has to be true of the first state. Sorry, if Q is an action, it has to be true of the first and second states and of the second and third states and of the third and fourth states and so forth. And we usually pronounce this henceforth. So henceforth A is gonna be true of a trace if A is true of every step in the trace. So that what does this say then? It says that a, a trace is a trace of the state machine S if the initial state of the trace is, is in the initial, it's in the set of the initial states. And if every step is in is is one of the next steps. And then we say that C implements S if this formula for C implies the corresponding formula for S. So so initial states of C and henceforth next of C has to imply that the, that the initial state is one of S's initial states and henceforth uh, the steps are going according to S. So how do we reason about these traces given this way of defining them? So here's the, here's the definition of the machine. The way you reason about it typically is by proving an invariant, which is some predicate that's gonna be true of every state. And for the proof to go through straightforwardly, you want the predicate to be inductive. That is, you want it to be the case that in order to show that I, I is always true, it should be true initially. So the only thing we know initially, initially is the predicate on the initial, yeah. that defines an initial state. So that predicate has to define I. After that, if I is true now, and if the truth of I now and the possible, you know, if the possible next actions implies the truth of I in the next state, then every, what that tells you is that every step preserves I. And if you know both of these things, that I is true initially and that every step preserves I, then it follows by a simple induction that the, the whole machine, you know, which is described by this predicate, must imply that I is always true. And the trick here is you need to have find an I which for which both of these things are true so that, so that it holds uh, always. And it also has, the I has to be strong enough to tell you everything you want to know. So here's a concrete example of that. Suppose that the, the machine is a procedure that has pre and post conditions and it terminates in some state done, then what we want for the invariant is what you can think of as a generalization of a loop invariant. But what does that mean? It's an I for which, first of all, this is true. And secondly, the precondition has to imply I and I plus being in the done state has to imply the post condition. which is all you're entitled to know about the procedure. So this is the right eye you know, for um, getting what you, yeah, for proving what, what you want to prove about a procedure. Okay, the next uh, step in the story is to understand refinement for state machines. So we've seen this idea of refinement a couple of times before, but it's, it's gonna have a new twist uh, in this account. So remember what a state does. A state is something that maps variable names to values. So in the running example we're gonna use here is we've got a code machine that has variables CX and CY whose values are five bit strings. So an example, a possible state of this code machine is that CX is equal to 011100 and CY is equal to 10010. A refinement mapping is something that maps a state of C to a state of S the spec. So in the running example, 
if, if S has variables X and Y, which are natural numbers, then the, the, and the, ref, the refinement mapping M that we want, want is presumably gonna be one that takes this state and maps it into the state X equals 12, Y equals 18. How did it do that? It did that by interpreting these five bit strings as two's complement numbers. Well, as, as uh, unsigned numbers uh, representing these two natural numbers. And if we wanted to, we could easily enough write down a formula that tells you exactly how to do that interpretation. Once we have this notion of mapping states, it's easy enough to generalize it to, to mapping traces by just, yeah. just applying it pointwise to each state. So the, the, um, the refinement of, of a trace of the code is gonna be a trace of the spec and it's you know, just the composition of the code's trace with the refinement mapping. Now, what does it mean for the code to refine the spec under the refinement mapping M? What it means is that M maps every trace of C to a trace of S. That's the same familiar story. Traces of, the original idea was rem remember that traces of C have to be a subset of the traces of S. But here, it, it's a little bit more subtle because you know, allowed for a posit the possibility that the representation of the state, even the visible state, is changing because the refinement mapping, for example, here, if X and Y and CX, sorry, if CX and CY, if X and Y are the visible state of the spec, then what this is gonna say is that after you've mapped the, the state of the code by the refinement mapping, you're gonna come up with a state of the spec which corresponds to S. So here we're making allowance for the possibility that we're gonna change the representation of the state when we go from the code to the spec, which is clearly necessary because we're not gonna write the spec in terms of these five bit numbers. We're gonna write it in terms of, of natural numbers. So concrete example here, M maps the, uh, this trace, which gives you, which has three states in it to this tr trace of the spec, which has the same three states mapped by the, by, by the refinement mapping. So one, zero, one, one, zero, zero maps to 12 and one, zero, zero, one, zero maps to 18 and zero, zero, one, one, zero maps to six and so on and so forth. So the essential point here is that under this notion of refinement, the external states can be different. So let's now just review what the logic is for refinement. If I is an, a predicate on S, state predicate on S, then I super M is a C predicate that basically says the same thing. So I tells you for a state of S, whether it's true or false. And, and I, am, I super M is gonna tell you for the corresponding state of C, whether it's true or false. This is what can, this can be extremely confusing because remember the mapping goes from states of C to states of S, but this, this um, uh, transformation on the predicates goes the other way. You start with an S predicate and it tells you how to get to a C predicate. How do you get to the C predicate? You use M on the C state to get you to the S state, and then you apply S to the S state. You apply I to the S state, sorry. So here I've written it in terms of functions, viewing the predicate as a function from states to true or false. Here it is, states to true or false. If I on the other hand is the lo logical formula that corresponds to this function, then I super M is the same I with every occurrence of a variable of S replaced by what the mapping does to it. So that tells us how to get from um, the, the logical formulas of the spec to the logical formulas of the code. So now let's just see how that goes in a little bit more detail. If A is an action on, the, on 
in the spec. But what does that mean? It means that A tells you whether S is related to S prime by this action. Then we can get a corresponding action on the code by applying by called A super M exactly as we did on the previous slide with this with the specs with the predicates for the with the refinement of the predicate. Now we're going to refine actions in exactly the same way. A super M of, of two code states is going to be the spec action A on, on the map, mapping of the code states up to the spec states. So this is a C action that in some sense does the same thing as in the code as A does in the spec. And as a formula, we do exactly the same thing that we did with, with um, the predicate. A super M is A with every variable of the spec replaced by, by the corresponding um, state function on the code state. So here's the picture. Uh, A takes you from S to S prime. A super M takes you from C to C prime. And the diagram is going to commute. So now, if S is defined, as we saw earlier, by the formula init S plus init S and henceforth next S, the refinement S super M is going to be defined by the, the formula S with every V, every variable V of the, of the spec replaced, yeah. replaced by its ma mapping from the code state. And then when does C implement S under M? The answer is if the code predicate implies the mapped state uh, spec predicate. So this is the fundamental uh, thing that you have to, in this in the state machine and, and logic formulation of things, this is the fundamental uh, formula that you have to prove in order to prove that you have a refinement, that the code implements the spec under this refinement mapping. So that was data refinement. It's the same essential idea that we have, have seen, seen a couple, couple times already of, of doing refinement mappings or abstraction functions. But we've souped it up by allow, allowing the states to, the state representations to change. In addition to that, there's step refinement, which, which basically means that it's always okay to, to take a no-op step or what Lamport calls a stuttering step. And a stuttering step is one in which all the variables remain unchanged. And we know we need that because we know that in general, there are going to be a lot more code steps than there are spec steps. Okay. So much for the mechanics of specs and code and refinement. Now let's let, let, now we're ready to talk about atomic actions. So what makes one of the actions of a state machine atomic? Well, there's two possibilities. One is that the underlying execution model says so. So for example, if the underlying execution model is x86 hardware, then there's some definition of what are the atomic operations. So hardware, for example, makes load or store of a single word or a test and set operation atomic. Uh, there are, of course, some complications if you have a relaxed memory model like TSO, but fundamentally, the hardware is telling us what the atomicity is. Uh, in the case of, of uh, sequential consistency, load or store of single word being atomic simply means that what the step does is to move the bits uh, of the source. Uh, move all the bits of the source to the destination and, and uh, everyone is gonna see that for subsequent steps. Uh, and if, for example, you have the, the TSO model, then what the loader store is gonna, what the store is gonna do is to move the bits from a register into, a, into the store buffer. And, and there's gonna be an, in, an additional internal action that moves the bits from the store buffer into the actual memory. The other possibility for getting an atomic action 
which is the one we normally have to work with because normally we don't get to mess with the hardware. We're kind of stuck with the atomic actions that it provides, which seldom are big, big enough to please us. So the other way to get an atomic action is by composition. You have two steps, A1 and A2. And if one, and one of them is commuting with every other possible action. And here I've said every possible action in a different thread. We don't have to worry about possible action in our own thread because only one action can take place at a time. And we, we know, so if, if our own thread is doing A1 followed by A2, there can't be another action of our own thread in between. <clears throat> so let's look at that in a little bit more detail. A and B are gonna commute if doing A followed by doing B gives the same result as doing B followed by doing A. So what does that mean? Either A1 followed by B followed by A2 is gonna be the same. If, if B commutes with A1, is gonna be the same as B followed by A1 followed by A2. The other possibility is A1 followed by B followed by A2 is gonna be the same as A1 and then A2 and then B. Either way, A1, A2 runs with no intervening steps. So it's an atomic action. So this is the basic strategy for making bigger actions out of small, smaller ones, is to show that, the small, that one of the small actions commutes with every other action that could be enabled at the same time. Let's just look at, before we go on to explore the, the, composition, the, comp, the composition and commuting case in more detail, let's just look once more at the, at the host case. So if, suppose X, Y, and Z are variables that are being shared between threads. Typically, X gets Y plus Z is not gonna be atomic on most hardware. And the reason for that is that other threads can change Y or Z in the middle of the action. Typically, there are going to be four hosted actions that are, are atomic uh, at the host level. Read Y into register one, read Z into register two, compute R register one plus register two and stick it in register three and then write it back to X. So you can see that um, reasoning at this level of atomicity is not going to be very appealing because there's going to be an awful lot of actions to worry about. So what's the story on commuting? We want actions to commute so that we can make have bigger actions. So there are two really easy cases for commuting. The first easy case is that actions A and B don't share any variables that change. In that case, they must commute. Because the actions, one of the action A can't be affected by anything that action B does since all action B does is to change change variables that action A doesn't touch. And this is the, tip, the, the strategy that's typically being used in distributed systems because in distributed systems, um, you have separate machines that have separate me memory. So all the variables are guaranteed to be disjoint. So, so the action of, actions that occur in one machine are not gonna affect uh, anything that happens in another machine, except by way, way of explicit communication with messages. And typically this is called sharding or sometimes it's called partitioning or striping. And this is the, the sort of the hardcore way in which we get con yeah. concurrency in, in distributed systems. For example, in the cloud, you have lots and lots of concurrency. You have these big data centers with uh, hundreds of thousands of machines. And on those machines, you're run, running hundreds of thousands of different applications that come from hundreds of thousands of different clients and, and they don't share any variables. So you don't have to worry. Uh, each one of those um, individual clients is, is running sequentially, essentially, except of course, for any internal concurrency that they might have. Really easy case number two is producer consumer. And that works because put and get operations on a buffer commute, as long as they're in different threads. They might not commute if they're in the same thread because in that case, the get might block waiting for a put. And this is typically called streaming or data flow, where the idea is that you have broken your whole computation up into a bunch of parts and a bunch of, a bunch of um, 
often they're called steps. So you have S, S, you have the S action connected to the T action. Sorry. Connected to the U action. And you just pass the data along from one to another. These arrows correspond to buffers where data it spits out from S and goes into the buffer, and then it spits out from the buffer and goes into T and so forth. And the only, the only thing that these, these uh, different parts of the computation share is the, is the buffers, and they only share them via these put and get actions, and those actions do commute. So here again, you're gonna be able to reason about what goes on in S, what goes on in T, and what goes on in U uh, completely uh, independently of each other. So those are the two really easy cases. Those are the ones we should always look for first when we're trying to figure out how to get yeah. uh, build a concurrent system that actually works. Then there's the easy case, which is not as easy as the really easy cases, but it's better than anything else. The easy cases, actions A and B hold locks, that, and the locks conflict, and that guarantees that A and B are not gonna be allowed to run, run at the same time, or to put it in, lang in the language of the previous discussion, if A is running, B is not gonna be enabled. So the, the way that works is, the, the first thing A does is to take out a lock. And the first thing that B does is to take out a lock. And if A is taken out a lock, then B is not gonna be able to get its lock because B's lock is gonna conflict with A, yeah. A's lock. And that's what locks do is, is um, pre prevent the acquire lock operation from being enabled if the lock's already being held by someone else. So what this does is to guarantee that, the, the, that there's a simple rule for how to deal, deal with um, two actions that do share variables. And the rule is, the simple rule is gonna be um, have a lock, for each variable. And hold the lock before touching the variable. And that will guarantee that B will not be enabled when, it's, when it touches a variable that A might be messing with. Actions of B that touch variables that A might be messing with are not gonna be enabled because A is gonna be holding a lock that's gonna keep that from happening. And we've, we've already talked at some, uh, some, uh, to some extent about um, how you can convince yourself that you're doing this correctly. But the essential notion behind locks and, and, yeah. and conflicting locks is this one. <clears throat> if, a and, if A and B are two actions that don't commute, then they have to hold conflicting locks. So that's the lock case. The other case that's easy for use, although maybe not for, for um, implementation, for coding, is the, is the case of abstraction. You, pre, you have some code, possibly complicated code for an action, and you prove that it's atomic. And after the, that, um, its clients can use the code without having to worry about all the complexity that's going on internally. Hard concurrency is when you don't have any of these cases. And the thing about hard concurrency is stay away from it. Uh, if, you do, if you do anything that doesn't fit one of these paradigms, then you basically, in my view, you basically have two choices. You can either do a correctness proof, which is gonna be hard work, or you can have a bug. And there's a lot of painful experience that says that this is the way, these, that these are in fact the two choices. If you don't, if you do something that yeah. you do, it doesn't follow one of these patterns, 
and you don't do a proof, then almost certainly you're going to have a bug. Yeah. The bug might be pretty obscure and it might take you a while to, yeah. to come up with a case in real life that exercises the bug, but it's going to be there. And then there's an, another kind of concurrency that I won't be talking about called eventual concurrency, where the notion is you relax the specification. So it's not, it's a qualitatively different thing. Okay, so now let's look in, in a little bit more detail at locks and mutex, locks otherwise known as mutexes. So we already said, if, if actions A and C don't commute, then their threads have to hold mutually exclusive locks, which guarantees that A followed by C can't happen because C is gonna be blocked if A is, if A is running. <clears throat> Um, so that's simple enough. Then the only thing we have to look at in more detail is what about the lock acquire and release operations themselves, m dot acquire and m dot release. Well, the, the only variable that they touch is m, so they commute with everything else except m actions. So the only question we have to ask is when do two actions on m commute? What are the possible sequences? Well, there's only two actions, so there's only four cases. So suppose you have action A, and then after that, the PC is at beta, and then action C comes along. So, so the question is, can action C be enabled when, when A is at beta? And there's four possibilities. A, H acquires the, the mutex, and H prime acquires the mutex. That can't happen because we know that the acquisition of the mutex by, by H prime is gonna be blocked because H already holds it. H acquires the mutex and, and, and uh, H prime releases it. That's not gonna happen um, because H prime doesn't hold M so it's not gonna be doing a release. And if it does do a release, something terrible will happen. There'll be some kind of error or, or unpredictable behavior depending on how compulsive you are about enforcing this. Um, what if M re releases the, the mutex and what if H re releases the mutex and H prime acquires it? That's perfectly okay. Uh, thread H is finished with this lockdown, so it's perfectly okay for, for thread H prime to acquire it. In the fourth case, uh, H releases the mutex and, and immediately H prime releases the mutex. No, that can't happen because both, yeah, we know that you can only do a release if you're already holding the mutex. And it, it can't be the case that both H and H prime are holding the mutex because the whole point of the mutex is that only one thread holds it at a time. So let's look that in, at that in a little bit more detail. What, that, what this tells us is that acquire commutes with any possible C at, at, uh, when the PC is equal to beta. Sorry. If A is acquire the mutex and then the PC is beta, then it's gonna commute with any possible C because any, any action on the mutex following the acquire is gonna be blocked by rules one and two. But a release doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily commute with an acquire by another thread. Um, release followed by acquire is okay by step three. We already saw that. That's just one thread giving up the mutex and someone else uh, acquiring it later. But an acquire followed by a release is not okay. That's, that's, that, uh, that's case two. Um, that couldn't happen because H prime wouldn't be holding the lock so it wouldn't be doing the release. So what that means is that you can't flip every possible C before a release. This tells you that you can flip every possible C before an acquire, but you cannot flip every possible C before a release in order to change ACB into CAB and thus make AB atomic, which remember is the game we're playing. We're trying to figure out how to get the C out of there so that AB can be atomic. 
So what that means is that, that after you, once you've done a release, your atomicity is over. Subsequent things are not going to be part of the same atomic action that ended with the release. Okay, that was sort of the intuition for how these, these um, mutexes work. Now we're going to look at you know, how to actually do a simulation proof that, um, that we get atomicity. So what is it? What, what are we trying to do here? We need a definition of that notion that C is enabled at beta and commutes with A. So what does that mean? It means that if you do A and then you're at beta and then you do C, that the possible uh, traces here have to be a subset yeah. of the traces that you get by first doing C and then doing A. So the, the, there are semicolons here. Let's uh, decode them. C commutes with A if and only if for every possible intermediate state, if U goes to UI and UI goes to U prime and UI and, and um, the PC at UI is beta, then it must be the case that there's some S such that U goes to SI and SI goes to U prime. So here's the picture. We have A followed by C in the, in the code and we're trying to prove that that's the same as, that, had, that has the same traces as the spec and the spec says C followed by A. So anything that A followed by C does, C followed by A also does. So this is what we're trying to prove. So here's the simulation proof. We wanna prove, copy from the previous slide, we wanna prove that A semi beta B is a subset of A semi B all the possible steps of this one are, are possible steps of the atomic one. So what we're gonna do for the simulation proof is we're gonna make A simulate skip and B is gonna simulate A semi B. That seems like a good bet because we, don't, we know more about A than about B. So we have a better chance of getting it to simulate skip successfully. So here are, the, here are the cases. One case is the spec is do nothing and then do the atomic action A semi B. And the code is first do A and then do B. And over here, we have a skip followed by C followed by A semi B. This is, this is the spec. We do C first and then we do the atomic AB. And the code is First we do A, then we do C, and then we do B. And at these points where UI equals SI, the PC is beta. So what's the abstraction relation for this proof gonna be? It's gonna be the identity, except when we're at beta. And there, the idea is gonna be that we're gonna relate any state UI um, that we can get to from S to S. So we start out, so at beta, the idea is that at beta, we haven't yet done A in the spec because we, we have a skip up here, but we have done A in the code. So here it is. If the PC is not equal to beta, then the, the abstraction relation says that the spec state and the code state have to be the same. If, if the PC is at beta in the code, then the code st state has to be something that you get to by starting in the spec state and doing A. So here's, there, there are three cases. Here's the case where we start out and we do A in the code and in the spec, we just do skip. So here we have equality, here we do A, here we do, here we have equality, here we do A. So that means that tells us that it, that 
this is going to match up because either way we started from S and we did A. For this one, we're, we already did the skip. So now in the, in the spec, we're going to do the atomic action, A semi B. And in the code, we already did A and now we're going to do B. So again, if U does B, we need to know that we can get from S to some intermediate state SI but by A and then on to B by S prime. But we know exactly what this S prime is. It's, it's, um, it's this U that we got to by doing A. And then the third case is the, is the commuting C case where we start out in S, we do C, and then relate that using A to the code. We start out in S, we do A in the code, and then, and then we do C. Either way, we end up yeah, going to use C by, by the definition of what it means for, for A and C to commute. So that was a little bit painful, but that's just an illustration of how you can pin down all the details of uh, why the why the mutex, why the whole thing, um, the whole story of, of uh, mutexes works. Questions? Okay, so now let's just look at a little bit of plus cal that corresponds to what we've been talking about. Um, we can define procedures, acquire and release. So what is the definition of acquire? It's gonna have a label here and it's gonna say, wait for M equals free and then set M to self. And notice there's no label here between these two steps. Yeah. So this whole thing, waiting for M to be free and setting it to self is gonna be atomic. So this is gonna exactly correspond to acquiring the mutex. And for release, if M is equal to self, then set M to free. Otherwise, okay, this spec says that if you, if you, don't, if you do a release and you don't hold the mutex, we don't know what's gonna happen. That's what havoc is. And then we can see exactly how we would use these operations. We have some processes and um, we have a non-critical section where presumably the processes are working on, on disjoint variables or have operations that commute for some other reason. In the critical section, the different processes are gonna have operations that don't commute on their own. And how are we gonna make it work? The answer is before we start the critical section, we're gonna acquire the mutex. And when we are done, um, before we go back to the non-critical section, we're gonna release the mutex. So this is the basic paradigm coded up in plus cal. And here is code that implements the spec. These two lines were the spec for acquire and release. Here is code. And this code implements um, acquire and release using a spin lock. So how does, how is this, how does this code work? We have a variable, uh, a temporary variable. And we say, while T is not free, do, here's a label. set T to the value of the mutex and then change the mutex to held. So that's exactly the test and set operation that the hardware provides where um, held is gonna be encoded as a one and, and free is gonna be encoded as zero. So we, we do this operation, we, we set the mutex to held and, and hang on to its previous value. And then we ask, was it free before? If the answer is no, then we go around the while loop another time. So we go round and round this loop, uh, repeatedly setting the mutex to held and, and hanging on to its previous value and until we find it, find the previous value was free. So this whole thing is gonna have the effect of making a transition. We're gonna be stuck here spinning until we make a transition from mutex equals free to mutex equals held, at which point we get to return. That's exactly 
what happens up here. We wait for him to be free. Up here, we wait for him to be free. And then we set it to self. Here, we're not keep, keeping track of which thread is acquiring the mutex. But that doesn't matter because we don't, we don't get to test who is acquiring the mutex. Who, sorry, so who, who is holding the mutex? The only thing we get to do is get into big trouble if we release it when we're not holding it. So it's it's up to what this spec for, for acquire and release says is that it's up to the clients to keep track of who's holding the mutex. Otherwise you're gonna end up with havoc when you do the release. So that's the spin lock. And then the release of course is very simple. You just store uh, free in, back into the mutex. And then someone else has a chance to escape from the spin lock, from the spin lock loop. So what's wrong with this code? Suppose we run this code on a Raspberry Pi. Is that a good idea? Well, the answer is no, because if you don't have, um, if, if you only have one uh, thread running at a time, then you're never gonna get out of the spin lock. Because the only way, if you, if you enter this, if, you, if you're at L1 and, and the mutex is held, then there's not gonna be anybody to, to, to make it free because there's not gonna be anyone else to execute a release. So you're gonna be stuck here. The spin lock yeah, is only a good idea if there's a possibility of there being some other action that will come along and free it. As a result of that, you don't typically see spin locks in application code. You only see them in, in kernel code where, where you know that there's some, that, that some uh, interrupt or, or some other running thread will free up the mutex so that, so that you can proceed. And finally, I just wanted to um, discuss a little bit the example that Leslie gives of a more complicated um, concurrent algorithm that's code, uh, coded up in PlusCal. So this alg algorithm is a, a much more sophisticated implementation of, of a mutex where here's the non-critical section, here's the acquire code, and here's the critical section, and this is the release. So I'm not gonna explain in detail, this code is quite subtle, and I'm not gonna explain in detail how it works, but I just do wanna point out a few things about it that illustrate the, the um, Way, the the, the um, careful way in which which um, having multiple processes has been integrated into PlusCal. So up here, we say there's a bunch of processes, and we're, we're identifying them in this application by a bunch of of natural numbers: one, two, three, up to n. We don't say how many of them there are. We just we don't sorry we we don't need to give n a concrete value. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of labels and therefore there's a lot of steps. And the reason for that is, is that, that this code, this algorithm was invented to be an efficient implementation of a, of a uh, mutex acquire operation for, for a machine. It wasn't actually a machine that didn't have a test and set, set operation or something um, similar to that, that allowed you to do implement this uh, spec for acquire directly, uh, but it was a machine where uh, it was known that the test and set was the hard, hardware did have test and set, but it was implemented very inefficiently, so it was expensive to use it, even in situations where there wasn't any contention. Um, in particular, it was a multiprocessor in which. Uh, the way you want test and set to work, work in a multiprocessor is that if the, if the lock isn't being contended for, it sits in your cache and you never have to reference the memory in order to do, do a test and set as long as there isn't any contention. But yeah. 
in this way, somewhat primitive, by current standards, processor, um, every test inside operation was caused a cache miss, and so it was expensive, and it was it, it seemed attractive to know how to do do a you know, sort of by hand implementation of Mutex Acquire that wouldn't have that problem. So I'm not going to explain in detail how this works, but I'm just going to, going to look at I'm going to point out that 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 these actions, each one of these basically corresponds to one machine instruction, which makes sense because that's the level of only level of atomicity that we have if we're trying to figure out how to write a sequence of machine instructions to implement uh, mutex acquire. And, and we'll just look at I've I've decorated this this. Uh, code in a way that the pluscal paper did not do with the necessary assertions uh, for, for actually doing the, the correctness proof. And I'm just going to look at one of these assertions, uh, which says that we set x to self here. And if x is still self, by the time we get to this point, then y is going to be non-zero. You might naively say, well, gosh, y must be non-zero because we just set it to self. But of course, that's not true because this, this is a multiprocessor algorithm. And some other processor might come along and execute this operation and set it back to zero. So why is this assertion true? The answer is um, the only way that Y can, Y start, started out non-zero here. The only way that it can become zero is for some other uh, process to execute Y gets zero because this is the only operation in the, in the code that sets y to zero. However, at this point where this operation is being executed, we know that this assertion is true, true because this assertion is true at the critical section yeah. and, and on to this point. So what this assertion, which I'm not going to ex uh, explain in detail says, is that if y is non-zero, then for every thread that's not self, If the PC of that thread is at step five or step six, that's right in here, then X is not equal to the other thread. And if X is, if that's true for all the other threads, then X must be equal to self. So what that means is that it's that that we don't need to worry about whether y is zero or not. So this is an illustration of how you can get from this code plus these assertions to an actual correctness proof for the code. What you have to do is for each assertion, you have to show that it's an invariant. That it's an invariant. The invariant for this whole um, for this whole uh, algorithm is if the if the for each process, if the PC for that process is is at, at is equal to L six, then this has to be true, and if the PC is equal to L nine, then this has to be true, and if the PC is in the critical section or L eleven then this has to be true. And you have to show that, th that those things are remain true regardless of what actions other processes might be taking. And the only way to do that is to look through all the possible action in, in this, in this um, you know, tricky piece of code. The only way to do that is to look through all the other possible actions, of which there's about 10, that the other that any that some other process might take and show that if the PC here is at L6, 
that none of those actions can falsify this statement. And similarly, if the PC is at, of, of, of my thread is at L9, I have to show that no action by any other thread can make this false. And similarly, if the PC is in the critical section, I have to show that none of the actions by any other thread can make this false. And the only way to do that is to go laboriously through every single possible one of the dozen actions of the other thread and show that it maintains this invariant. Final comment about this piece of code. Uh, we wanted it to guarantee some property. And the property is that only one thread can be in the critical section at it. Only one process can be in the critical section at a time. So this is one way to say that. There are several different ways to say it, but here's one. What does this say? It says that for any process other than self, the PC of that process is not equal to CS. So that tells us that if, if we are here, no other process can be in the critical section. And this is the property that, that we that we we're trying to prove. Remember the story I was telling you uh, near the beginning. Um, the way you do correctness proofs for these state machine guys is you find an invariant which has two properties. Number one, it really is an invariant. That is, every 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 step maintains it. And number two, uh, it's strong enough to tell you what you want to know. So if you add this to the invariant, then clearly it's going to be strong enough to tell you this. And this, in fact, is what you want to know. Okay, that was pretty much everything I had to say. Uh, I'd be happy to entertain questions about this whole way of doing business. If there aren't any questions, I will just ramble a little bit about the difference between this way of doing business, Leslie Lampert's TLA slash plus Cal way of doing business, state machine way of doing business, and the language oriented way of doing business, which um, is represented by most of the, of the uh, papers that we're reading in this course and by, by, and by the lab work. Most, as we you know, see by, by reading, as we see from the reading, most of the people that have worked on doing correctness proofs for, for um, concurrent programs, which after all is really what PlusCal and TLA, TLA was designed for, most of the people that have done that have worked in the language model. And it's not entirely clear to me why that's true. Um, it's certainly true. It's certainly true that the well reset. One reason that it's simple and fairly clear: uh, the language model. One of the things that people have worked on fairly hard in the in the context of the language model is to be able to, to extract runnable code from the. the um, description of the algorithm that you write down and, and do a correctness proof for. And the motivation for that is obvious. Uh, if, you, if you take this code that I've just shown and do a correctness proof for it, there's another step you have to take in order to actually get something that you, you can run in, in your operating system kernel, which is, or, or application for that matter, which is you have to translate this code manually into machine instructions. And of course, that, there's a, that's a potentially error-prone process. Uh, in, in the case of code like this, it's, it, you might say it's fairly unlikely you'll make an error in doing that translation because this code was writ written with the explicit idea in mind that each, each of the um, steps co corresponds directly to a machine instruction. But certainly for most descriptions uh, that you use, if you look at the other examples in, in the PlusCal paper, for, for instance, that's not gonna be true. There's gonna be significant steps between the code 
that you, you do the correctness proof for an actual running code. And um, Pascal, discuss, Leslie discusses that at, at some length in the Pascal paper and says, this is okay because what we're doing here is we're writing down, writing down uh, executable code. And if we, Straightforward to produce executable code, we would cripple the power of the language. And if you remember back to the Amazon paper that we read at the very beginning of the course, uh, they make this point too. Uh, they they don't have any. In fact, they don't even have any aspirations to do uh, proofs at the algorithm level. They only do model checking. Um, and and the story they tell, which. I think it is completely plausible. The story that they tell is that uh, they're finding the hard bugs this way and bugs that are introduced in translating from the fairly high level plus Cal or, or TLA code that they write into executable machine code. There's certainly you know, bugs that are gonna be introduced that way, but they're gonna find them during their normal testing process. Whereas the subtle bugs that they can find uh, by writing the algorithm in PlusCal and subjecting it to model checking are ones that are going to be much more difficult to find by the normal testing process because there is so much non-determinism uh, in, in the presence of all the, the uh, concurrency and, and failures. So that's one difference. Uh, the other reason perhaps that the uh, language approaches much more fully developed than, than the state machine approach, aside from the possibility of, you know, of, of you know, automatically, automatically and reliably generating executable code. Uh, the other difference it is, I think, more a cultural one. Uh, the Amazon guys, as I said, don't even attempt to do proofs. They just do model checking which of course is much easier than, than doing the proof. But uh, PlusCal and TLA actually do have an apparatus for doing proofs, but it's much less highly evolved than the corresponding apparatus in COP or Isabel or HOL or any of the other um, systems that, that, are, that we read about in the other papers in this course. And I think the reason for that, as I, as I was starting to say earlier, is fundamentally cultural. Uh, the, the, most of this work, work it gets done in Europe, and you know, certainly all the major, ex, with, with the exception of Daphne, uh, all the ma major systems for doing program verification were developed in Europe, and, and developed and maintained in Europe, and they've just had a, a, a lot more effort put into them than has been put into the the uh, uh, the proof generating tools that surround. Uh, plus Cal and TLA. And I think this is just an outgrowth of the way people in Euro uh, Europe have, have been doing formalization for 40 or 50 years. It is a little bit curious. One other thing that I wanted to, to say that I, I should have said earlier and forgot about, um, we've looked in some detail at concurrency during this talk. You might wonder about the other source of non-determinism and, and trouble the, that we concern ourselves with a fair amount in this course, which is which is crashes. So how is uh, how is a plus cal program going to going to represent crashes? Well, there's going to be another process that's going to be different from processes one to n. Uh, the other process is going to be the crash process. And it's going to, if you look at it, its actions, there's going to be a loop that says anytime there could be a crash. And when there's a crash, various parts of the state get erased and um, uh, things get set up so, so that another process called recovery can run and do the recovery. And then in order to do a correctness proof, you have to show that um, whatever invariants there are that you're relying on 
are maintained in spite of the fact that the crash process might do its thing at any time. And again, um, in, the, in the labs, uh, we're working with an infrastructure that facilitates this some because it, it ha has some built-in machinery for represent, representing the occurrence of crashes and, and the invocation of the recovery procedure. And if you, you work in, in the TLA, you have to code that up for yourself, but it's fairly straightforward to do. And one advantage of, of that is that uh, you can, you can uh, work with any model that for, for uh, the occurrence of crashes that you want, since nothing is, is predefined. Just as you can work as, with any model for, the relate, for, for how threads work that, that you want, since none of that is predefined in the basic machinery. Okay, that's pretty much all I had to say. And let, let's, uh, so if people want to ask any questions, we've got a few minutes. One thing that I was wondering and trying to uh, square away in my head is how exactly to think about uh, commutativity. Because uh, I guess it's, it's you mentioned, for example, that uh, if you have a mutex release uh, that sort of ends your atomic action or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess it's not, I guess, depending on how you look at it, it might not necessarily end your atomic action. It might be like a action that as opposed to commuting to the right, you'll just commute to the left. And after which, for example, you might have a Q push or a Q append or whatever. Um, and you move both of those, you know, commute all of those to the left and maintain your atomicity. So I'm trying to figure out how, how this sort of compares to the way of looking at it, uh, to the way of looking at like left versus right movers and, and stuff like that. Right. Uh, well, I, it, I, I think it's, it's true that it's not, depending on what the other guys are doing, it's not necessarily the case that after you've done the release, you're going to give up atomic, atomicity. Mm -hmm. but in the standard paradigm where, where you're, you're maintaining, uh, you're maintaining uh, atomicity by holding locks before touching variables, that is going to happen. And that's the mm -hmm. reason for what um, in the world of locks is called two-phase locking, which says uh, you should acquire all your locks before touching the variables. And you should do everything that you want to do before releasing any of them. I see. So, but yeah, yeah. I think, I think what's going, going on here is that there's a, there's a dichotomy between the fully general setting, which, which indeed is the one that I was presenting to you, and the, you know, the, the standard discipline that people use yeah, yeah, in the context of using locks to protect access to variables, or, or for that matter, protect access to any, any sort of non-commuting operation, which is in which it's definitely going to be the case that, that if you release a lock, uh, someone else could come along right away and acquire it and then start messing around with, with the variables that were protected by that lock. So anything involving those variables is not gonna, is not gonna continue to be atomic. Okay, if, if, um, if you do something, I wish I wouldn't do that. I just need a place to scribble. Uh, if you do something, involving the variable X, and then you do a release. If a release the lock that is protecting X, then someone else can come along and acquire the X lock, and then they can do X gets five. All right, and so if after that, if this is the other guy, if after that you do, um, x gets x plus one, say, it's not gonna be the case that whatever you were doing with x here is gonna be atomic with this x gets x plus one because someone has come along and messed with it. So in that particular um, way of deploying locks, um, I think what I said is gonna be true be because um, 
you don't really have you don't have the option of of um, moving these guys. If you move if you move if you try to move this x over to here, yeah, it's not going to be the case that 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 you still have commutativity. Sorry, right. So if you have an operation like this, for example, in the other thread, and you imagine, what if it's here? Could we move it past the release? Um, right. that, that's, just, that's just not gonna work. Right, right. Okay. Other questions? Okay, then I guess we're done for today. See you on Thursday. Uh